So everyone, I'd like to introduce you to Lindsay. I was recently introduced to Lindsay by a friend and I was inspired by her story as a sister of someone with a disability. So she has a 16 year career in special education as a special education facilitator, born out of her passion for working with people like her brother. While her background is in K through 12 special education, I thought she'd be a wonderful gift on this series because of her firsthand lived experience of working with, advocating for, and enjoying meaningful relationships with people with disabilities. Plus the dynamic of working with others, whether they're kids or adults, it's very similar in a lot of ways. Now for many of us, our connections to groups different than our own, it's often very intellectual and it's well-meaning, but it can also make us uncomfortable talking to someone who's different, especially when the terminology is something we're uncomfortable with. And I know I've had that experience when it comes to the disability space. So Lindsay, thank you for joining us and sharing some of your insights on how that language has evolved and especially why the R word is not something we use anymore. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here and share my experiences with all. Can we start with the R word? So when when you and I were first talking about this, you actually used this phrase, the R word. Um, and I thought, it, it made me think for a second, like what is the R word? And then I thought, then I got it. So can you talk, what is the R word? And then why why is it so bad? Yeah, so the R word is what we would say as retarded. Um, it was a term that was used to diagnose people with mental retardation. Um, it's not something that we use anymore because it's become a pejorative term. Um, and so, you know, because it's been used so negatively to hurt people for that purpose, um, to even use it is um, very uncomfortable for people, especially with um, disabilities or family with disabilities, um, members with disabilities. What's, what's interesting is there are a lot of terms we just throw out there. Yeah. And even when you talk about disability, there are, okay, so for the record, folks, as you know, usually this, this is not a scripted conversation. So I may throw something out there if Lindsay, if you're on, if you don't really know, it's okay to say, yeah. I don't know. Um, but I'm thinking now about the, the inclusive language conversation. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to use that's a word that's negative. You don't want to use a pejorative. You don't want to use something out of context, especially if you're not really sure who you're talking about. But I've heard words, even now, handicap parking, disabled, um, mm -hmm. disability itself is a word, or able-bodied. I know that I've, I've been surprised to hear that some people don't care for the term able-bodied. So is there any insight you can share around what's the difference between these words and why does it matter? You know, when I think about the word disability, you know, it, it evokes this idea that you are other, you know, it is putting a label on someone. And so, you know, one of the things that's beautiful now that we've learned, we use people language first. Right. You know, we would say, um, Lindsay, who has autism, Lindsay, who has an intellectual disability. Um, that way we're recognizing the people for who they are, but also recognizing that they, there may be um, difficulties or challenges that these people face. But when you lump everybody in and say they are this disability, they do have these challenges, that's who they are, that's when you kind of get into those problems of segregating or to differentiate or to stereotype people instead of actually looking at them for who they are. And so, you know, it it, it is a it is also, you know, it is also part of our identity. You know, I live with a disability as well, and I understand that it's part of my identity, but it's not something that I necessarily go out there because I don't want people to see me for my disability, but I want them to see me as I am. Right. And, you know, so many of our disabilities are invisible. And I say are because I am also someone with a, a disability and it's an invisible disability. Now, if anybody's listened to me on this webinar, I bring it up a lot. I mean, I share it um, because anybody who hasn't heard it before tends to be surprised because we all think we know what a disability looks like. Mm -hmm. um, 
And even for an invisible disability, you know, an invisible disability might be uh, someone who's on the autism spectrum. So it isn't visible in the traditional sense, um, especially if it's really about uh, communication, like if they're nonverbal. Mm -hmm. I won't know that they're nonverbal until they don't speak to me. Right. Um, and then at that point, I'm potentially judging them because I've gone into judgment the minute that they weren't interacting with me the way I thought they would, because I can't visibly tell that they have, you know, uh, that they're different in terms of neurology and brain wiring. Exactly. And it's, and it's one of those things where it's, you know, it's just different. You know, I think that it's easy to categorize people. And, you know, with your example that you were talking about, maybe someone who is nonverbal, there are ways to communicate that are not conventional or traditional, but that doesn't mean that they're incapable of anything. It just means that you have to adjust and you have to accommodate people in order to give them the opportunity to express themselves in the way that they're able to. Now, I've had some sessions already uh, where I've spoken to, uh, to the concept of intersectionality. I also had concepts about um, a, a session last year, I actually think it was last December, on um, neurodiversity. And one of the things that I've noticed, actually it was more the neurodiversity than the intersectionality. One of the things that I noticed was that brain wiring is not just something like somebody who's on the autism uh, spectrum or somebody with a learning disability or communication challenges. I have ADHD. I was literally on a Zoom earlier today with somebody who has ADHD and we were both exchanging, you know, some of the frustrations and experiences of how we think and how that translates into the words that we have to formulate to express our thinking. And there's a lot of effort there. And so does that sound familiar? Absolutely. And that's one of the things that's beautiful about having, you know, a a non-neurotypical brain. You know, we do think differently. There are things that, um, you know, there's this wonderful book called A First Rate Madness, and it's about these incredible leaders throughout history who have had um, challenges like that. What's that title again? A First Rate Madness. First Rate Madness? Yeah. Okay. It's a wonderful read, and it talks about how these um, these challenges of people who have maybe mental health or who have, um, you know, you, you use the example of ADHD and it's a beautiful thing that people with ADHD or people with, um, you know, different neurochemistries are able to think because they have to think outside of the box, right? The world isn't designed for people with disabilities right now, you know, and so in order to to acclimate and to get into the the, the um, business world and all of these other things to have communications with people, you do have to be a little bit more creative with the way that you communicate. And there are creative ways that that, that may manifest. There are ways that we may um, think outside of the box or give insights that other people don't know. So it is kind of like a superpower, you know, and if we just accept that or understand what that is, then we can all harness that and utilize that. And, right. and communication have isn't just the way I do it. Is 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 right. it's so diverse. I don't mean to use the word um, in a silly way, but it is. I mean, diversity is diverse, and and yeah. and any one area of diversity is mm -hmm. complex and nuanced. So before we go any further. I want to make sure we launch our very first polling question. Plus, I know in the conversation we might give it away, and I don't want to do that. So how about we go to the first one, Jasmine? Yes, my pleasure. I went ahead and launched poll number one. This is poll number one of four. And to respond to these polls, you're going to click the radio button that corresponds to your answer. And be sure to click submit. These polls are counted for completion, not accuracy, but you'll want to get your vote in before we reach our one minute threshold. We've got about 30 seconds remaining on poll number one. For some reason you're not seeing that poll, please refresh your browser. I wrote that book down. I'll repeat it for anybody else. A first rate madness. I'm going to have to check that one out. 
You know, something you said, Lindsay, made me think about, you know, the world isn't, our world isn't set up or something like that for people with disability. I'm thinking something people can relate to. Business mm -hmm. is designed for extroverts, yes. not introverts. And so if any introvert is listening and has had to find a way to adapt <laughs> Um, into the workspace because you work with a bunch of extroverts, you might understand what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you say that because there are things that, you know, you don't have to have a disability in order to understand these, these principles, oh. in order to understand. Um, Absolutely. And by the way, the, repo the results are being shown here. 25% um, of the people say, well, actually, you know what it looks, can, I don't know if you can see the results, but it looks split. It's, it's 20, 25, 30, 35. So what's the answer? What is the percentage of the U.S. population that lives with disabilities? 26% of adults in the United States have some type of disability. That's surprising, except that it's not surprising because we know one in four people worldwide generally have a disability. Mm -hmm. And like you said before, there are seen and unseen disabilities, you know, and I think it's important to have that conversation because, you know, we do through social media or through the things that we've just learned up until this point. I mean, it was I mean, relatively recently that they passed the Rosa's Law where we stopped using mental retardation and started using terms that were more accurate, you know, intellectual disabilities. And um, it, it's 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 interesting to think, you know, of getting out of our mind of what it looks like to be disabled. And so to understand that 26% is, is a large chunk of society. Yeah. And I mean, when you say one in four, and then roughly 70% of those disabilities, or the, those people with disabilities are invisible. So I'm in the 70%. I'm in the one of four. Um, yeah. And I will say also, I, so I have epilepsy. And I was diagnosed with epilepsy in my mid forties. And that's another statistic that I think people, um, so first of all, disability is a wide range of things, including some health conditions that people have that are classified as disabilities. And most of us will have an event or a diagnosis as we get older associated with disability. So, I mean, the, 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 this isn't just the exception. This isn't just the, the random person that I happen to see on the sidewalk in a wheelchair. Exactly, exactly. Now, somebody is asking a question. What is the cause of a learning disability? So before we do that, I wanna pull up this slide. Can you talk to us about the definition? Um, maybe a little bit more what you were thinking when we were putting these slides together? Sure. So learning disabilities are disorders that affect the ability to understand, use spoken or written language, do mathematic calculations, coordinate movements, or direct attention. Um, so there are other factors. There are genetic factors. There are um, uh, uh, environmental factors. And then there are also the fact that you know, we have more diagnoses now than we did before because we have more awareness of them before. We know what symptoms to look for. So between those three things, that's how we diagnose a learning disability. A lot of the times we, um, as a teacher, we would see them throughout school. You know, we would see that maybe um, a disability such as ADHD, like you were talking about before, you know, it would lead students to fall behind other academics to where they may be two or three levels behind because they're not able to necessarily think and, and absorb the content. So even though it's not a learning disability, it affects learning. So that's interesting because I want to say when I was growing up, ADHD was a negative label. Mm -hmm. It was perceived as a person who had a problem. Yeah. And in my brain that makes it a disability, but you're saying, and we now know that there's something called neurodiversity and these are interconnected terms, but they don't mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. Is ADHD still considered a disability? You know, I don't want to say a hundred percent. I know from my experience of working with students with ADHD, 
if the ADHD, the attention, you know, deficit, hypertension, disorder, yeah. Disorder. If it is severe enough, yeah, <laughs> it's a disorder, yeah. And if that disorder, if it is severe enough, if there are symptoms that, you know, you have to be able to to first absorb the information before you can process it, before you can apply it. And if that information is being blocked because your attention isn't there, because maybe you lose interest and, you know, you're getting distracted by different things, or maybe the ADHD will cause behavioral, um, you know, outbursts because you, you can't sit still, you know, physically you cannot process the same as other people. And so, you know, if you have ADHD and you have those, those um, coping mechanisms in place and you are on grade level, you know, you use those coping strategies and you use the things that you learned in order to, to learn um, just as anybody else would. I mean, it is it's just learning differently. But if a diagnosis such as, you know, since we're talking about ADHD, if a diagnosis such as that um, severely impacts or hinders a student's ability to learn, mm -hmm. then that's when we would consider it uh, we would have like an IEP, an individualized education program, or have accommodations. Um, we classify them as other health impairments, OHI. Um, and so it's not necessarily a disability, but we use that in order to tailor our instruction to help people with disorders that um, adversely affect their ability to retain information and to use that information. And, um, to get to higher order level thinkings, if that makes sense. No, it absolutely it absolutely does. And so one last thing to stay on the ADHD thing. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to, to harp on it. I think it's something that many of us are familiar with. Um, that challenge with learning that a child with ADHD might have, by the way, I wasn't even diagnosed with that until I was in my late thirties. Um, and it explained a lot of some of the things that I had learned to do. I didn't even know they were coping mechanisms, by the way. They just, just the way I figured out how to do things. But that part of that point is that there are things that change over time, but those fundamental challenges are still there and they're mm -hmm. there in your coworkers. They're there yeah. in your supervisors. They are there on your executive leadership team, which means they aren't, a weakness and not a disability. So disability, um, I have a de definition that I use in my sessions um, mm -hmm. that it, a lot of people see it as uh, an illness of some form, but what I try to reinforce is that it is a physical or a mental condition that limits movements, sensors, activities, and emotions. So it's not a diminishment of some capability so much as a limitation of some functionality um, in, in our brains. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody did ask a question. I want to make sure we answer this one now. Is there, is a cognitive disability the same as an intellectual disability? So I don't, I want to say that they're the same. So in order to answer your question, let me go back. Um, a little bit. So, so nowadays, instead of saying mental retardation, that was sort of like a catch-all for anybody who had um, some sort of latency in learning. Um, what we know now is we have specific learning disabilities, and so that could be like a you know processing issue. So they might be able, not be able to do mathematic calculations. When we talk about cognitive disabilities, um, I think what you mean is intellectual disabilities and Intellectual disability it, disability is actually the term that was replaced with mental retardation. Really? So you have, yeah. And so, so you have that is disability. A, so, sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt. It's so funny because it's hard with the lag. But so intellectual disability is the replacement for mental retardation. And it's an umbrella term. Yes. But within that, then, there are different classifications or types of intellectual disabilities, one of which might be cognitive. Yeah. Am I understanding now what you said? 
<laughs> yes. Okay. So, it's a lot. It's yeah. It's complicated, which is what I. It is. It is very complicated, and you know that brings up a great point. You know, with cognitive disabilities or intellectual disabilities, there there are nuances. You know, and I. I'm not a you know psychiatrist where I've you know I've known those nuances. They had a battery of tests now that they use, and like you were saying, you know there are different levels of severity, um, to where based on all of these different tests that we use, based on data, empirical data that we use, we can tailor that in order to give the people, the students, the people what they need. Right. So it's less of this like umbrella term where you're just like, oh, you know, intellectual disability, cognitive disability, that just, yeah, that means everyone works on this, this in this way for everybody who was diagnosed with this. Right. Um, isn't true, you know, and, and we're learning through um, medical development, psychological developments, uh, you know, studies that have been done and having all of these people come together and say, you know, to have these different um, experiences of people so that we have a better understanding that it's, it's not about the diagnosis. I mean, it is absolutely a part of it, but that is just one piece of the puzzle in order to um not work with but in order to address some of the challenges and to make those challenges a little less challenging both in school and in the workplace there's a great book um that i know i read that i found to be a turning point for even just self-acceptance with this diagnosis and it's called driven to distraction um, I've read that book a couple of times now. And so for anybody who has a colleague, a child, a partner with ADHD or any form of attention um, challenges, that's a really great book because it helps us understand just from what you're saying, ADHD has this label of you can't sit still and you can't focus on anything. But what we know is that that's actually not true. Those are two points two data points, two behaviors and challenges that some people might have with ADHD. So understanding the complexities, even of something we think we know, and I don't wanna say this to think, okay, now we have to know everything about everything or we shouldn't talk about anything. Cause then we get into this space that we often find ourselves in, which is, forgive me for using the word now, but paralyzed for being able to, to, to even engage in a conversation. Right. You know, even, you know, it's funny that you see that because even now with the experience that I have, you know, I don't have all the answers, you know, and I'm like, there are nuances because every single, you know, case is different. Surprise. And, and that's, that's sort of what the message that I feel so passionately about is, yes, we, we need to understand these terms. We need to understand how it affects people we need to understand the individual the humanity the human in people and and understand that people with disabilities are going to be able to tell you this is what my disability is this is what i am challenged with this is what i need help with this is what and then if they don't we know we have advocates who can say let's sit down let's talk about what your struggles are what's out there and make those connections and make those bridges um, now there's this slide I want to make sure we put up percentage of adults with functional disability types. And so there are um, a, a range of things that are on this list. Can you help me understand what this means, especially as it relates to what might be some of my coworkers and colleagues? Sure. So um, we do talk about, um, you know a spectrum a lot of the times when we talk about a spectrum of disability it's talking about autism spectrum disorder um when we talk about functional disability types um there are mobility issues those are the sort of the things that we talk about you know with the handicap maybe um a wheelchair is necessarily or necessary or crutches or you know some sort of oh just a walking aid is one example exactly exactly um cognition 
there are a lot of ways that cognition can come into play, a lot of different areas. Um, one from, you know, it says right here, difficulty concentrating memory or making decisions. And that's where we get into specific learning disabilities. That's where this, um, that group would fall into here. And when we talk about specific learning disabilities, it's not about, um, you know, an intellectual disability. I think it's really important to differentiate the two. A learning disability, a specific learning disability means that there is some part of the brain that is not able to process the same way. So it might be math reasoning, you know, or reading is a big one, you know. Um, for me personally, too, and I, I know that other people can relate when they start reading, you'll read a page, you know, and by the time you read the first sentence and then the end of the page and you find yourself reading the same page over and over again, and you're like, I have no idea what I read. You know, yeah, that, um, I, you say that and I, I don't read, I don't learn by reading. Exactly. I have always struggled with that. I am what they call a visual learner and all of us fall on some spectrum there. Um, but I have found that if I were to close my eyes and just listen, I will remember what I've been told. If I can open my eyes and anchor it to something visual, I'll remember it even better. But if you were to have me read those exact same words that were spoken on a page, I would be stuck. I, I, I would do exactly what you're saying. I'd read the sentence. It's almost like I would read it out loud. Yeah. And because verbalizing it will help me. Now I'm looking at the time. Wow, we have other polling questions and there are a ton of questions in the Q&A. So I think our conversation might be driven by the Q&A. Um, but before we do that, let's go ahead and launch. Let me see our second polling question. Second poll has been launched. Should we live on everyone's screen now? Let us know if you feel comfortable talking about people's disabilities. There are quite a few questions in here, Lindsay. So perfect. I will do my best um, with what I know to help. And I want to also remind everyone that um, we do get the, at, at, after the webinar, we get the list of questions. Um, we try to respond to as many as we can. Sometimes it's hard. You have Lindsay's contact information on her bio slide. You have my contact and information at the end. You are welcome to email us um, directly if, if you just have some follow-up that you'd like to ask. Um, yeah to follow up, please do. Um, this is something I'm passionate about. If I don't have an answer right now, it's it's something that I can definitely look into. And we can just have a conversation about it. Um, and that would just be wonderful. <laughs> I'm here. Uh, so what are the results? Are you Sometimes. comfortable talking about people's disabilities? Sometimes, often and always. We have 15% of people who are neutral and 11% who say never comfortable. So I think that's positive. Most people say they're comfortable talking about people's disabilities. Yeah. Now, are we comfortable talking to people with disabilities? Um, okay, so I'm going to park that. I'm writing that down. <laughs> um, comfortable talking, because you have a TED Talk in here. I watched it and there's some really important points in there. Um, all right, so, uh-oh, it says I have to show my screen. It didn't show up again. You got it now, thank you. Oh, I did? Okay, I don't know what happened. Oh, it went away. We just had enough. So this is a short answer, hopefully. Um, resend that pop-up, please. Say that again, Jasmine, I can. The, the screen, it, it, it disappeared, so I'm gonna resend it over to you. Well, you were, you did share it and then it, Disappeared again, but you should have it now. <laughs> Can you see that? Yep, we're good now. Thank you. Um, where does something like narcolepsy fall into this conversation? Is that from a Q&A? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that wasn't me. Otherwise, <laughs> I might have, we might have had that pre-conversation. Um, you know, that's interesting. Um, I have... Noise. I have a sleep disorder as well, um, and so I'm speaking from personal experience. I don't have narcolepsy, but if it impacts your ability to function on day-to-day -day things, I'm not 
qualified to tell you if it's a disability or not. However, I can tell you. So I'm getting a little emotional because it's so important. Yeah. Because people have things that affect their ability to work. And I know that it's very frustrating. Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, it's hard. I do this work every day and I've learned to share stuff that's very personal. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not any less emotional. Like for example, one of the things I learned about ADHD that I just found so validating in the diagnosis is one of the challenges might be inability to read or difficulty reading social cues. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that I was just doing a session yesterday when I said that I am an extrovert, but socially I'm an introvert. And in fact, if I could avoid social interactions altogether, sometimes I would, because if you put me at a happy hour or a networking event and I have to like sort of, Hey, how are you? And like, be able to ping off of how you're responding in order to calibrate my response. I struggle with that to the point where I feel so self-conscious that I just don't want to talk. Yeah. And if I don't talk, I feel so conspicuous that I need to talk and it's, it's difficult. Yeah. And you're just like spinning. You're like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, and then you're in your head and then you can't figure yeah. it out. And um, I thought it was something wrong with me. And as I turned out, I have ADHD. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with me. It exactly. just means my brain processes things differently. Yeah. All right, let's so come go back real quick to the narcolepsy um, comment real quick, the question. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, you know, and I know that it does adversely affect, um, you know, there were times when I would fall asleep as well, and they wanted to do a narcolepsy test as, as well for me, a sleep disorder. Um, and it, it was for me, I don't, I, I don't know, you know, the other person's experience, but I know for me, it was, it was very vulnerable. I felt very vulnerable because a lot of the times when people say you're sleeping, they, they equate sleep with lazy, but that wasn't the case at all. My body was just disparate from what I wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I really, you know, with people who are advocates, I really hope that you're able to find somebody who's able to accommodate you to where let's say you are having an episode that that doesn't hinder who you are or your capabilities or your, your ability to do the job or to do life. It just means that there is something that, that somebody should be able to offer you work accommodation to accept who you are as you are with your narcolepsy. Right. right. And it's interesting that, as you know, when you know better, you do better. So I, I put up here on the slide, um, the definition of a reasonable accommodation and some of the examples you gave in resources. And while that's there, I want to get um, a lot of these questions in here. We're gonna try to have, we're probably gonna have to go through them very, very quickly here. Um, okay. One question, oh, I lost it. Is, does learning disability improve through early intervention? Yes, absolutely. In my, in my experience, uh, the, the earlier interventions that you can get. So what happens is when you go through, you know, if you get, let's say you got diagnosed uh, in second grade, right? We can, we can address those. We can get the interventions. We can get consistency. We can get those patterns, the coping me mechanisms that we were talking about to close those gaps. Um, if intervention isn't happening, that the tendency for that gap to expand um, is more likely. So the earlier you can do the interventions, the better. Yeah, and I would say the diagnosis as well. Uh, somebody asked, oh, you know, we need to work on the Q&A design. I'm just saying. I'm <laughs> scrolling around and I'm losing them because people, they're very, very small, which is why I put my reading glasses on, except I don't want to wear reading glasses. Uh, somebody asked, what are the signs of ADHD as an adult? And so, Sarah, I can tell you that there are something like 15 different indicators, and adults may have any combination of those two. They're listed in the Driven to Distraction book, which is how I um, was able to notice that maybe I had quite a few of them and pursued, pursued diagnosis. Um, so what I would encourage people to do is to, to look at a resource like that, because there's just no way we can cover that here. Um, 
Does the 26% stat include physical disabilities that can be corrected with prosthetic devices, such as eyesight, hearing, mobility, but which may contribute to a person being challenged? I would say that that would be, uh, what would you say, Jana? I would, I would yeah. say that that would still qualify as a disability and Absolutely. they do have supports and accommodations and that's sort of what right. the aim is and to have accommodations so that we can all be on that same. Equal playing field, right. So, yeah, absolutely. So once you've, by providing the support for the disability, so now mm -hmm. you can live your night life, I hesitate to say normally, um, yeah. without being hindered by the disability, doesn't take away the fact that you have a disability. Right. Somebody said, this is a comment, uh, funny, I'm deaf in one ear, but that been that way since I was very young and I never once until now, considered myself as having a disability. I'm currently 60 plus years old, LOL. Thank you for sharing that. I won't say your name. Thank, for, yeah. thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. It, sorry, real quick, you know, like I think that's a great point. Just because somebody has a hearing or, or isn't, you don't have to identify as being disabled or say you have a disability. That might just be a hint, like, you know, whatever that means for you. Um, it, it, like, again, we're not, you know, there is no labels. We're going to put a label on you. We're trying to get away from that, you know, and just hopefully that everyone treats everyone else equally. Sorry. I, I know, know that we I am looking at the time. It is flying I'm by. So I'm like, right, Lindsay, so we need sorry. three hours. We need three hours. <laughs> um, there are questions. And then there's, I want to, uh, all right. So can you spend just a few moments now? Yes. I'm going to start putting us on timers relationship di dynamics i was really intrigued when you started putting this list together because this is what we deal with at work um that some of the very barriers and the challenges people have mean somebody's going to come to me for work technically but i don't have a social connection right or um somebody's going to filter what i'm doing based on a stereotype um how do i say this they think i have a particular problem mm -hmm. because of that problem they only hear six of the ten things that i'm contributing does that make sense like so how so by what i mean by that is they're filtering me mm -hmm. because of the stereotype that are applying to me there are things they're going to discount well because she has blank or she yeah. is blank or struggles with blank. Right. So how does this influence then in your experience, at least certainly with your brother, I think you also shared some stories. People get treated differently. Yeah. It's a, it's a difficult thing for me to, you know, I want to preface that this, you know, the things that I talk about are through my lens. Um, and so I'm very grateful for to be able to um, speak. I am going to be using the R word because it is something that um, has affected my life in a very profound way. Um, my brother was diagnosed with a mental retardation. You know, at the time, again, it was MR is what we would say. Mm -hmm. And he was capable. He was able to go to mainstream classes and they put him in there but that wasn't the issue he was able to keep up academically but the kids would see that he was other and they would say you know you retard you're just so retarded i mean just really putting him down and i remember him coming home just um, just feeling so, I don't know if defeated is the word, but it affected him, you know, it affected us. It affected us. him and it affected you. And that's, that's marginalization. And I think the adult version of that is, um, nobody asks for your input at work. Nobody yeah. invites you to lunch. Yeah. Um, people make assumptions about you and then they only approach you based on those assumptions. Um, 
I'm talking to save you because I see you are getting emotional and I know what it's like when I'm getting emotional and I want to yeah. stop talking, but I feel like I can't. So I hope I, I hope I bought you a moment. Um, I did. Thank you. I did have to gather my thoughts a little bit. Um, I, I want to come to this and and because I want to recommend folks, please watch this. This is phenomenal. Um, she says some things in here that speaks directly to what you're talking about. So for example, and I, I wrote some of these down, she said, in her wheelchair, people felt compelled to say things to her like, it's amazing to see you out, like what, I'm not supposed to come out? Or <laughs> right. somebody on, on a bus she was riding one time congr congratulating her for getting out and not letting it hold mm -hmm. her back. Um, she said, another person said, you don't see people like you out having fun. <laughs> like, well, what do you mean by like you? And mm -hmm. she said she felt hyper visible and invisible at the same time. And, and, and there's so much more that she said, but she also ended it by saying, and I think this was really powerful for me, and I'm quoting here, access is about believing that disabled people have a right to participation and that each and every one of us is responsible for that. So I, it, she speaks to a lot of what we are ta what we're talking about here. Particularly um, for me, it resonates in the workplace because we know that disability is strongly tied to unemployment, underemployment, and isolation at work. Yeah. You know, it's it it is great. So when I was looking at the stuff, you know, it 19.1% of persons with a disability were unemployed, but that is a 1.2 increase from the year before. 63.7 were um, employed, um, 1.9 increase. So we have seen an increase in these, but I think that there is still, and I don't, I don't mean to bring in, uh, you know, but recently with uh, a major company that got taken over, it was like remote work was just not an option anymore. Oh, and well, we should have a whole conversation about remote work and what we've learned as a result of COVID because people with disabilities, um, people from marginalized communities really started to thrive in remote environments, but it also created a whole host of other challenges, including increases in anxiety and depression and feelings of isolation and loneliness. Um, mm -hmm. so. I'm yeah. sorry, but I do think we need to take another polling question, or I promise you somebody in the queue is going to ask us to absolutely a polling question. So, well, here it is right on time. Let us know if you personally know someone in your organization that would benefit from workplace accommodations. This is poll number three up on your screen, and we'll leave this open for another 45 seconds. I just want folks to know we're asking this not to pry. I think what we're asking here is just to connect mm -hmm. the ideas of accommodation, which had, you know, we showed those on the screen earlier, with colleagues, because I think, I don't think we understand uh, um, accommodation. When this is over, Lindsay, I'm, we're going to have to do like rapid fire Q&A. Because there are yeah. a lot of questions, we'll get through as many as we can in the like yeah. nine minutes that we have left. Plus, we need time for that last polling question. So okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a minute. I should set my timer. <laughs> I'm gonna do that. Thank you. I always need help with. That's one of the things that I need help with. I'm actually gonna set my timer for a minute, and when it rings, we know we got to wrap up and go to the next question because I could use that too. Perfect. All right. So let's see. What does the answer say? I personally know someone in my organization that would benefit from an accommodation. There you have it. 37% say yes, and 34% say they're not sure, mm -hmm. which is, thank you for sharing that, everyone. Um, I, I think, found that interesting. Yeah, they're not sure. All right, you ready? You gonna ready yeah. to do the rapid fire? All right, I'll ask the question okay. and then I'll set the timer. Okay, first. Okay. Um, okay, is this even a question? Hold on, let me pretend like I can read, see it. In the workplace, wouldn't it be better for the person who has an unseen disability, cognitive, mm -hmm. to fully explain that condition to their supervisor and coworker at the outset so that the supervisors or coworkers don't have to guess how to interact with them? I think communication is key. You know, the quick, the, like just the same with disability, you know, with us uh, education, you know, if you can get that from the get go and have everything out there, then 
expectations are incredibly important as well as communication. So that fosters that. So I think it'd be very important. I'll add to that though, there's also the risk of um, stereotyping and other miscommunication challenges. People are afraid to reveal something to their employer for fear of relegation, further mm -hmm. marginalization or dismissive, you won't get the good assignments. And as a result, it'll be counter uh, effective. So. Absolutely. And I would refer them to like a consulting firm or, you know, some, we, um, you know, my company, we, we go in and we say, Hey, make sure that these people are still heard and they're, they're in there. Um, you know, all right, sure. then look two, one perfect timing. Listen, do you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> perfect timing. All right. The next one, I've learned a tremendous amount of coping skills. Um, it's nice to understand that there's more than one way to look at a situation without being right or wrong. Okay, thank you. That was a comment. Thank you. I appreciate that comment. Thank you. Um, I think like many, TikToks about ADHD have made me suspect that I myself have ADHD because so many things they say just make sense. What are some resources of, for learning to cope? How can I discuss with others appropriately before any official diagnosis? That's a harder question to answer. That is a harder question. Um, I think it's important to learn that ADHD manifests differently in different age groups, in different genders. Um, if you have, um, I think definitely reaching out to people who have ADHD or had the diagnosis and talk to your medical professional about, you know, if you have one, if you have access to one, that'd be a great place to start. Um, or a psychiatrist and they can do um, assessments to, to see what's going on and to, to give help if you need it. Yeah, I hope the book that I listed helped. I can't say I've read any other books, um, but absolutely. So my son's, um, my younger son was diagnosed with ADHD and I read the book to better parent him, which is how mm -hmm. I became aware of what it might look like in an adult. But that diagnosis for my son started with our um, primary care physician. So you're absolutely right. Like all of the continuum was there and I'm fortunate enough to have had that, that coverage. Um, but today's medical practitioners don't always ask. So you might have to bring it up. Um, if a company is inclusive of neurological diversity, what types of accommodations would be typical for an adult that has high function, functioning autism, Asperger's, anxiety, ADD, things like that. So I don't know if you can think of any types of accommodations sort of off the top of your head here. I mean, it's, it definitely is a case by case basis. Um, the first thing that comes into my mind is because of that social aspect, uh, I'm speaking for myself with the social aspect. A lot of the times it's easier to communicate uh, via remotely or electronically that way you can kind of gather your head thoughts you know it's a little less social cues that you have to pick up on and it's just the concrete you know emails or the facts that are on the page um, as far as ASD accommodations they may be like you know different uh, work schedules a flexible work schedule or um, more flexible working environments to where, hey, if somebody wants to work for, you know, especially, you know, I have bipolar and sometimes I, you know, I go through these things and sometimes it's great for me to just have that time. If I'm going through a manic episode, I just use that time. And then if I need to, I'll take a couple days off in order to facilitate my personal needs. And so it's, it's definitely a case by case basis, but there are things out there. Um, I would, I would add that um, a lot of what you're talking about aren't accommodations in the traditional sense, because I think most people think of accommodation as screen reader. Uh, right. Right? Like something right. that is tactile and um, operational and functional. What you're talking about in terms of accommodations are what we're starting to understand about um, creating a, a space and an environment that can help people thrive. And a common example, by the way, is we ask everybody to speak up in a meeting because then we want to be inclusive. But some people, and you said it a moment ago, some people need to think about it first. Some people don't feel comfortable speaking up right away. They're happy to share, but you've got to give them time to process what they just heard before they can share. Um, yeah, yeah, process, exactly, processing time. Um, is OCD 
obsessive mm -hmm. compulsive disorder considered a disability? And can somebody have OCD and ADHD? The answer to that is yes. Yeah. What's the difference between the two? Oh, I, you know what? I see this question and I don't know that we are um, the right people to answer that question. But Ron, I would certainly say email one of us. We can follow up and, and help with that question maybe. Is that yeah. fair? Um, people seem to believe that age is a disability and assume that a lot of things because of a few wrinkles. Okay, that's a comment. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. That's a comment. Um, awesome. But I also think there's something called ageism that's very real. And thank yes. you. I think we need to cover that in a future session. Yeah. And just sorry to piggyback on that. Um, as you get older, adults age 64 years and older have a disability. And a lot of that is because, you know, as we get older, we may run into more health problems. So two and five. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> Does severe panic disorder with PTSD fall into a disability category? Yes, I would say yes, because that is, for me, that is something that is the biggest struggle as well. I cannot go out to the world or if I'm in a meeting with a ton of people, my anxiety just shuts my brain off. You know, for me, it, it, it disables me to do my job at the level that I want to do it. So in that way, I would say that it's a disability even though I'm not like, I'm not, I don't collect disability or anything like that. But um, for me well, personally. Well, and what I think you're doing is broadening the conversation because there is a disability that is um, maybe clinically diagnosed or medically diagnosed. That doesn't mean that they don't manifest themselves in different ways. So somebody could technically have a medical disability, but not need any form of accommodation and be highly right. functioning. Right. And then somebody can have suffer from anxiety and depression to the point where it can be crippling. Right. And uh, that it can create balance. Uh, bal I'm trying to say I'm mixing two words together. Challenges and barriers. I was going to say balances and charriers. I do that. All the time, <laughs> that that's part of the that's part of my. So one of the small things that I have is I have um, bits of dyslexia. Which is related to but not the same as but it, there's a link between that and my adhd brain fascinating stuff um somebody asked if having no smell is a disability actually that's another medical question that i don't know that we can answer so um, i think there are some stuff i mean there is a difference between a disorder and a disability right obsessive compulsive disorder um a disorder is a medical condition that may give rise to a disability depending on its severity but there is a distinguish between the two got it that's helpful thank you yeah. mm -hmm. um somebody is mentioning here uh, a reference to the ada and a new bill that passed in colorado that expands on it um, and extends the websites that provide additional resources and i think what's important there and i don't know that we have it let me look at the slides you did have so here you have some resources um eeoc office opm has a lot of policies that spec that that the federal government has policies and a, and a lot of organizations frame their policies around the federal policies um ada national network is a resource the ada is this um americans with disabilities act is the law that we have to comply with so there are a lot of things that are out there um we're going to have to wrap up here, but I want to include this this here because these were so meaningful to me um, yeah. that these are the three, if nothing else, to take away. We want to take these away. So I'll give you a minute. Do you want to speak to what these mean? I would love to. Um, the first one that is so important, anytime I would come in, um, with a student, I mean, there is a, you know, talking to, you know, back to my family as well, you know, there's, there's always a sense of anger, you know, what did I do wrong? What, you know, they're different, they're, uh, I failed, you know, there's a, there's grief, there's a lot of things that come to, and I always tell the parents, it's not worse, it's just different. Yes. It's just, I love that. Um, and more beautiful in a lot of ways. And so I just, that's the message that I always, it's, it's, it's just different. Um, it's an opportunity to have creative ways to communicate. You know, I, I really think about this when I think about students, uh, you know, people who are on the autism spectrum disorder. You know, 
they communicate in a way in order to, everybody communicates in our own way. Right. Um, maybe the communication, you know, they can't be verbal. It's okay. We can use like the little push buttons or we right. can sign. There are other ways that we can do that. By the way, Jasmine, I'm oh, sorry to interrupt. Jasmine, why don't you go ahead and launch that poll while Lindsay is sharing her, these thoughts. I want to make sure we get that done. Yeah, um, sounds good. And then Lindsay, the third one is learn from each other. Learn from each other. Um, and I think that really fosters a sense of community because at the end of the day, we are all part of community. We're, we're all humans. We all want to connect as humans in spite of all of these challenges that we face. And there are a lot. I mean, we went through a pandemic together. Yeah. Our gener I mean, we've, we've gone through some stuff. And I think at the end of the day, when, when we have an open mind and say, Hey, this person is not disabled. This is just a person with a disability. Right. Um, learn from them because they probably have lessons or insights that, that others never had. And so in order to learn from each other and build on each other and have that sense of camaraderie and community, be open and curious. Ask the yeah. questions. Well, you know? thank you, Lindsay. That, yeah. totally relates um so thank you yeah. well i think that poll is about to close and as it does i just want to invite everybody this webinar is every other friday um and okay so i just lied because two fridays from now is thanksgiving so we're skipping out a week december 2nd james wilson will be joining me um and he went through a journey to find his adoptive parents. He was raised in the United States. He's Filipino, but raised in the United States by a white family. And just is sharing some interesting um, insights and helping us understand the difference between culture, mm -hmm. ethnicity, heritage, and nas nationality. And, and this is really important in terms of developing cultural um, awareness and sensitivity. So just invite everybody to join me that webinar should be open for registration, probably closer to Thanksgiving. And as I said, thank you so much for joining me, Lindsay, or us. And with that, Jasmine, I think we're gonna close it out. Back to yes, you. absolutely. Please check the schedule on our website for additional information and resources. And we hope to see you all very soon on a future webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.